The first parsonage I ever lived in was on the land at the far end of a farm of a church member. He had donated the land to the church so they could build that parsonage. And it was an active farm, and not just any kind of farm, but a dairy farm. And cows grazed on one side of the road, and then they would be crossed over, the, they had to cross over the road and be milked, and they would cross back over to the fields once more. And Jimmy had two dogs that were excellent at following his commands and as equally as efficient in rounding up the herd, no matter what side of the road the cows were on or how far they were out among the fields. Jimmy gave the commands, and the dogs would be gone in a flash, busy at work. Jimmy also had a small flock of sheep on the far side of the farm. He never once mentioned that he would shear the sheep for wool. I could go weeks, even months, without seeing the sheep. And I once asked him, Jimmy, why, why do you have sheep? And he told me, so you'll have a sermon illustration one day. <laughs> Actually, he, he kept the small flock of sheep to train the dogs. The dogs needed to learn on the smaller animals, and then they would get confidence, and then they could go among the herd of cattle and round them up. And I couldn't imagine what Jimmy would have done without his dogs. Doing all the work of rounding up the cows or summoning the dogs to round up the cows that might break free from the enclosure. On one wintry evening, Elizabeth and I, we felt the house shake. And to my surprise, the cows had gotten spooked and they stormed the fence and they were drawn to the outside lights of our home. We're talking about a hundred cows running full speed right next to the house. I called Jimmy and told him, I hate to wake you up and tell you this, but your cows are stampeding around the house, sliding down the hill and into the woods. It was quite the sight. Now, I thought it would take a long time for him to find all the cows who were now hiding in the woods and bring them back to safety. I went outside, and I could hear Jimmy from afar summoning the dogs, letting the dogs out, and in minutes, they were at our house, and they were rounding up those cows, and those cows were now back safely in, among the, inside the gate. All of them back at home within minutes. You know, in the Western world, we're used to seeing dogs do the work of herding, not shepherds. Dogs are bred to perform such duties. If not dogs, perhaps the farmer just gets in the tractor and tries to reel them in that way. But in the Near East, in the time of Jesus, and even today, the shepherds are the ones who would lead the sheep from place to place. They didn't do it by walking around them and trying to go around this way and that way to get them to where they wanted to go. They didn't get behind them and start shouting orders to the sheep so that they could go where the shepherd wanted them to go. They didn't send forth the dogs to, to make all that ruckus and to the nip at the heels of the sheep. They did it by being out in front, out in front of the flock, and then calling them by name. With their voices, the shepherds would call the sheep, and the sheep would follow. We read in the scripture lesson that the sheep will not follow a stranger. The stranger is just another shepherd who has his own sheep to follow him. It was customary for the shepherds to give nicknames to the sheep, and the shepherd will then call them by name, and they would follow. That comes in handy when several flocks of sheep are in the same uh, sheepfold in the village town. And, and so the shepherd would come and call out his sheep, and the sheep would respond to, to that familiar voice. Why? Because they become familiar with that voice. The voice would call them by name. They trusted in that voice. The one who had led them into the sheepfold would then lead them back out and go forth to graze. The other sheep that didn't belong in the flock will remain until their trusted leader, the shepherd, will come and call them by name. If you didn't grow up in the church, the language of God as shepherd is a rather foreign concept. Because in our culture, shepherding is done so differently here in the United States. 
Knowing the contrasting herding styles, we can better understand why and how Jesus used this shepherd language, this shepherd imagery of Jesus as the good shepherd. And that image of Jesus as a shepherd, it's so inviting to us. It's so welcoming and comforting. I grew up in a church that had lots of stained glass windows, and one of the windows was of Jesus holding a lamb in one hand and had the shepherd's staff in the other. Perhaps you've seen that kind of stained glass window. And so you, you, you gaze upon that window, that image, and then you hear, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or, or you hear the verses that follow our gospel lesson today, I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. And it's easy to find comfort with that familiar image and the beloved passage of scriptures that speak of this nurturing aspect of God, of being loved and cared for, or even sought after as in the lesson when the, night, the shepherd goes to find that one lost sheep, leaving the 99 together. If we only have our context, we think Jesus as a shepherd sends forth the dogs to do the work. Kind of a passive agent who just gives commands. The dogs are not welcomed by the sheep or the cows. They, they seem more afraid of them. The dogs are then the only ones who need to know the voice of the shepherd and to do what they're told. But not so in the Near East. The sheep have come to know and trust the voice of the shepherd, and they're willing to follow where he leads. They trusted the one who would lay at the entrance of the sheepfold and be the gate, keeping away all that was threatening while preserving their life. And we hear in our gospel passage this day, when he, the shepherd, has brought out his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. You know, it is well known that, that newborns will respond and turn to the voice of their mother and their father over any other voices that are just as soothing and nurturing and caring and welcoming. Why is that? Because even in the womb, for months, they have heard the voices of the parents more than any other voices, except for maybe that older brother or sister. When they hear their voices, however, they brace for impact. <laughs> See, the voice is how the parents are known at first. They'd heard the voices above all others. An infant can be attended to and cared for by doctors and nurses and grandparents and aunts and uncles and older siblings and cousins. But when mom speaks or when dad speaks, you've seen it before, the baby will naturally turn toward those voices, even when there's so many other nurturing and caring voices in the room. See, there's familiarity there. A bond and a trust that developed when a consistent voice in the darkness of a womb was something that the baby had learned and could recognize. Infants welcome the voices of their parents, but then they turn three. <laughs> and then they become teenagers. And then young adults who know more than their parents. You know, in life, the parents are just one set of voices amid competing voices, all seeking to influence, some positive, some negative. And hopefully those initial familiar voices can still be heard and can still lead throughout life. And hopefully the voice of the shepherd introduced by parents and grandparents and Sunday school teachers and choir directors will be a familiar guiding voice throughout their lives. See, ultimately, we desire for our children and our grandchildren, our friends, a spouse, our neighbors, our youth, our fellow church members to come to know the voice of the Good Shepherd and become familiar with that voice so that all might follow him and live abundantly that life that Jesus provides. We hear Jesus say, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And when he's speaking of this life, he's speaking of eternal life that begins here and now. We don't have to wait for it. We can experience the joy of God's presence and God's love and grace. And what a joy to have that awareness this day. We as Christians want to help each other come to know the voice of the shepherd and become familiar with his voice ourselves as we live the Christian life and enjoy this abundant, eternal life. 
Becoming familiar with the voice of the Good Shepherd, though, it takes time, it, it takes practice, it takes certain disciplines in place to help us learn and discern the voice that, of God speaking to us today. For one, it takes consistency on behalf of God. It takes consistency upon, uh, on behalf of the Good Shepherd, and this consistency is something that we can place our trust in because throughout the Scriptures, we hear about how God is with us. Hear now that speaks about some passages that speak about the consistency of God that we can trust, we can place our trust in our God. After Moses led the people through the wilderness, it was now Joshua's turn to lead. And we hear such wonderful words from Moses when he says, Be strong and bold, for you are the one who will go with the people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their ancestors to give them. And you will put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who does what? Who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. In front of the book of Isaiah, do not fear, for lo, I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. And then in the letter of James, hear these words, draw near to God. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. In Jeremiah, we hear, For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you, and when you search me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. And now from the good shepherd himself, who's going ahead of the disciples to prepare a place for them, he says, I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you shall live also. And one more for good measure. In the gospel of Matthew, when Jesus commissions the disciples to go out into all the world, we hear those last words of the gospel and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. See, throughout scriptures, the scriptures reveal the ways that, that God is faithful and can be trusted and how God continually comes to us and, and is with us. The scriptures also reveal the ways that God speaks to us and how we can listen to, to God's voice. In the Old Testament, God first gave the law, and this articulated the, to the people certain moral expectations. We are to live in a particular way within the boundaries that are set by the commandments. And these boundaries didn't fence us in and restrict us, but these boundaries actually give life. And our life and the life of the community flourishes when we abide in God's commandments. See, we can hear God speak through those commandments. And we hear in Psalm 1-1, Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit at the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. And we can only take delight in the law of the Lord when we read God's word and we become familiar with it and seek to live in a particular way of loving God with all of who we are and our neighbors as ourselves. For the Bible is not just a Sunday morning book used in worship, but a book when open and read, when meditated on a daily basis can certainly be that lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. In our daily reading, we can hear God speak a life-giving word, an ancient word, yes, but a word that can lead us to life, that abundant life. And when we stray from this, when we are not as consistent as we once were, when we are not in sync with God's teaching or lying with God's will in our life, all is not lost. For God continues to, to call out to us and beckons us once more to, to come and follow in the teachings and the way of God. For our God who gave us the law also sent forth the prophets to sound the call for people to return, to sound the call for people to once again obey the commandments. 
And in that call, there's an opportunity for renewal. There's an opportunity for forgiveness to be brought back into the community of faith and to walk with the Lord, experiencing wholeness and peace, which is shalom once more. I hope that in our time of worship, when reading personal devotions or when we gather at the table for Holy Communion, you, you hear the prophetic call to come home and to be renewed as a child of God and, and seek to listen not just to the voices of, of preachers and prophets, but of our, of our good shepherd. As Christians, we believe Jesus to be the Word of God, the Word of God incarnate in the flesh. And in following the teachings of Jesus, we're following in the way of the Lord and seeking to obey His commandments. We learn to listen to this voice each time we, we open up the Scriptures and, and we read the stories and we hear and we read the stories of God's grace thrown, shown in Jesus Christ and His mercy, His healing and compassion. And we, we do that over and over again. We become familiar with the one who knows our very name. Just like that shepherd who knows the name of his sheep. We become familiar with his voice each time we worship the Lord, each time we sing songs of praises and listen to lovely songs that invite us to consider the ways of God. We become familiar with the shepherd's voice with each prayer offered in that powerful name. Only we must pray long enough, not just for God to hear us, with our wants and our desires and our needs and our things that keep us up at night so that we might move from talking so much to God and be still enough and listen to that voice, to listen to God in prayer as much as we talk to God in prayer. And in doing so, we, we receive such insight and discernment and we can simply have that awareness that we're not alone with what we're dealing with in life that God is is with us and every time we call on the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth to lead the church once more and offer consistent with the teach word consistent with the teachings of God the Father and God the Son we hear God speak once again words of love a word of encouragement a word of hope a word of conviction a word of assurance See, God speaks to us in so many ways today, and we would do well to sift through the voices that distract and seek to become familiar with God's Word, God's Son, as we are with the words of our parents or of our children or our grandparents, a spouse, a trusted friend, and colleague. And like newborn babies who turn toward their loving parents because they're familiar with those voices, the voices that provide comfort and trust we can then readily turn to the God of love and experience comfort and trust and joy and peace. And as we become familiar with the voice of the shepherd, we're then willing to go where God would have us go and do the very things that God is calling us to do and be the very people that God is calling us church to be as we seek to walk in the way of Jesus. The shepherd calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. He goes out ahead of them. And the sheep follow him because they know his voice. May this be true for us. As we follow the one who came to give us life. And that we might live this life rather abundantly. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.